Hello and uh, welcome to the first ever AP Laser Workshop. Uh, thanks everybody for joining me today. Um, hopefully we'll have a little bit of fun, uh, can learn a little bit. Um, we're pretty much the purpose of today is to kind of go through and, and show you how to go from start to finish on processing a, a photograph and putting on, on a piece of slate. Um, I have a piece of slate right here. Um, this is available for pur purchase in our AP Laser store. Uh, you can get a piece like this, which is an 8x10 uh, piece of slate for right around uh, $5. Um, I did a little bit of prepping before we had started. Um, typically with slate, because it's a, a little bit of a dollar kind of uh, stone, what I actually do is I use this right here, which is a uh, acrylic lacquer spray. Um, I can pick this up at Walmart for right around 4 or $5. Uh, this here just gives the, the slate a nice little glossy finish and helps uh, make your image stand out and pop. Um, so it is something that you would want to coat the slate with uh, ahead of time. Um, now, right now we're going to be doing some Q&A uh, towards the end. So if you do have any questions along the way, please just kind of write them down. Um, and after we're done with our presentation, we'll kind of circle back around and, and get through everybody's questions. Um, so without further ado, we're going to go ahead and jump into it and uh, start on the, the software. So I've got my image already pre-selected, which is right here. And so I'm going to go ahead and open up my Corel Photo Paint. Uh, Corel Photo Paint is the program we use for all of our uh, photo editing. Um, I'm going to start a, a new document here. And I'm going to go ahead and name this uh, just so I can keep track of it. We're going to call this AP Workshop 1. Now when we're setting this up, uh, we're going to come down here to our background color. Um, you'll notice in some of our other videos uh, that we have coming out in the future that this color may change. Um, a lot of this is based off the material. So I'm using uh, a dark gray or black slate, uh, so I want my color to be black. I'm gonna come back down and I'm gonna adjust my sizes for my eight by 10. And I'm gonna set my resolution or my DPI for 150. And I'm gonna go ahead and hit okay. And so this brings up uh, my little working area here. And over on the right hand side, I've got my different layers. Right now I just have my background layer. So I'm gonna go ahead and import in my image. And just anywhere inside my working area, I'm just gonna go ahead and drop him in. Oh, had a little bit of a glitch there. Delete that layer, try this again. And there we go there. So right now we can only see the image that's fitting inside of our working area. So if I zoom out a little bit here, I can see the edges of my overall photo. So I'm gonna come right here to the corner. I'm gonna click and just drag this guy down just to uh, kind of fit him in here a little bit better. So what we're gonna do today is I'm actually gonna go through and show you how to do an isolation um, to get rid of the background. And then we're gonna draw a nice mask around this so we can get rid of kind of this flat bottom edge here. So the first thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna come over to my imported layer, which says background two. And if I double click on my mouse, I can change the name. I'm just gonna abbreviate this for ORG, so I know that's my original. And then I'm gonna go ahead and right click and go to duplicate just to duplicate that original image there. That way any alterations I'm gonna make on this is going to be on the duplicated layer and not my original. I'm gonna go ahead and, and come over and turn my layer off for my original. And then I'm gonna go ahead and double click on this one and call this my cutout. So with my layer selected here, I'm gonna come up to image and come down to cutout lab. So in here what I want to do is I basically wanna take um, my pen and just trace around the edges of the image here on what I'm going to keep. 
So I'm going to start here. And now, this is kind of a user preference kind of thing, but with me, I just kind of prefer to get a general cutout um, and then clean this up afterwards. Um, other customers may like to just come in and get as close as they can uh, to save them on cleanup. Either process is totally acceptable. So once I've got this drawn around or highlighted around and I've got a full connection here, I'm going to grab my fill tool and I'm going to come in and just fill in the area that I want to keep. And go ahead and hit OK. So as you can see, my, my image kind of shrank here a little bit, and I'm left with just my little isolation. Um, one tool that I prefer to use or like to use is called the Object Marquee, and it's located right up top here. So if I clip, click on my Object Marquee, I can see this faint blue line going around the edge of my photo. So what I want to do now is I want to kind of come in and I want to start erasing and cleaning up this area on the outside to get as close to the image as possible. So over my left hand side toolbar, I'm going to grab my erase tool. And I'm going to come up to the top left hand corner here. And this is where I can change for my different style nibs. Um, my personal preference is one of these shadowed ones right here, which allows me to get a little bit closer to the image without uh, taking too much away. So with that selected, I'm going to go ahead and zoom in. And I'm just going to start cleaning up around the edges here. Now if you notice, that blue line kind of goes away as I'm cleaning up. And honestly, what that blue line is there to do is to show me any areas like here where I may have missed erasing the image. And if I turn off this marquee, we don't really see anything there. But with the marquee on, we can see that area that still needs to be cleaned up. Because even though we can't see it, your laser definitely will. So again, we're just going to kind of come through and clean this up a little bit. And again, you can see how I'm getting really close to my image. Now, when I get into these smaller little areas here, where my nib is a little too big to fit in there, um, I can quickly adjust my nib by holding the shift key and then my left mouse key and then rolling my mouse in or out to make my nib smaller or bigger. Now when you get to a photo that may have some small little details like this, um, you can come in and adjust your nib and to make sure to get through every, every single hair here. What I'm going to do just to save a little bit of time here is I'm just going to kind of get rid of it and I'm going to use my erase tool almost kind of a shaping tool. And so I'm just going to kind of cut off the top of that, but I'm going to do it in a way to where it makes the hair look somewhat normal. Now that we've got this pretty well taken care of, we're just going to kind of come through and clean up some of our edges here.
that little area there. All right. Now that we've got our image cleaned up here, um, I've got two real options here. Because the photo has a hard edge at the bottom, I would have to either bring this photo down like so um, and try to expand it up a little bit more, or what I can actually do is create a mask and just kind of hide his shoulders here. So to create a mask, I'm gonna go over to my left hand side toolbar and I'm going to grab my ellipse tool. Now, on standard, it's going to have my square ellipse or square mask. And if I hit my little drop arrow for my sub menu, it'll allow me to select my ellipse mask. So from here, I'm just gonna go ahead and draw a circle around the area I wanna keep, like so. And then I'm going to add in a feather around my mask. Um, this will just kind of give the edges around here, the bottom, um, just a little bit of a, a softness to it, almost like a blend. Uh, so I'm gonna come up to my mask tab after I've drawn my mask and come down to mask outline and come over to feather. Now right now I've got my view on, so it's actually showing me how far outside of my mask that I've drawn the feather's going to go. Um, I can have my view right here so I can turn that on or off. And I can adjust the width on how far it goes out right here in my width. So you can see how that's kind of adjusted down here. Um, I'm gonna set my direction for the outside. And my edges are going to be curved. And I'm gonna go ahead and hit okay. Now we can see how our mask has increased in size and actually has fallen down to the bottom of our photo. Now when something like this happens, we want to avoid our mask going below this hard edge here. Or we can risk getting what we call kind of like a flat tire kind of look to it. So right below my masking tool is my mask transform tool. This allows me both to move my mask around or if need be, resize it. Which I can come right here to the corners and kind of move in a little bit if I would like. So after I've drawn my mask, I've added in my, my edge feather. I'm gonna come up to the top and go to Object, Clip Mask, Create, From Mask. And so again, you can see with my object marquee on, it's still showing the shoulders, but the mask is actually just hiding them. And turn that off there. So to add a little bit more to this, um, I'm gonna go ahead and add in what's called a drop shadow. My drop shadow is over on my left-hand side toolbar towards the bottom and is right here. I'm gonna go ahead and click on my drop shadow and I'm gonna come to the middle of my photo and I'm just gonna click and drag and we can see the white edge in the background here. Now, we, if you do this for the first time, your color may be set to black. So if we come up to the top here, we can add in and change it to white. Going along my toolbar, I'm gonna to come over here to the right, and I'm gonna set what type of mask that I want, uh, or drop shadow, I'm sorry. And I'm gonna go ahead and select uh, linear and just like what we did with our feather, I'm going to select the outside. I then can come right to where my square is that I've drawn, and I can bring this back down a little bit. So he's a little bit more on the outside, and we can see down here on the bottom how it's bringing out our feather a little bit more. So then what I can do is I can shadow my feather, which is just gonna make it bright, or just kind of bring it in close. And then I can adjust my transparency. So if I just want a nice little soft, subtle glow, I can adjust that up. I'm gonna go ahead and increase the size of my photo just to make some of our detail pop out a little bit more here. 
and we can kind of center, center it up right inside here. So from here, what I'm going to go ahead and do is I'm going to go ahead and create a save file. Uh, this is just in case I wanted to come back and, and do a little bit more editing to this. I'm going to do save as. And for AP Workshop 1, and our file type is a CPT or a Corel Photo Paint. And then save here. So my next step, now that I'm done editing this, is I'm actually going to go ahead and export this out. So I'm going to go to File and Export. And I want my Save As type to be a Windows bitmap or a BMP file. And I'm going to go ahead and select Export. Uh, this dialog box pops up here. Um, basically just ask me how I want to save this. Um, I'm going to save this as flattened, and what this is going to do is just condense all of these layers I have on the right hand side down to one. Right. So now what we want to do is we're going to go ahead and minimize our Corel Photo Paint, and we're going to open up Photograve. What Photograve is going to do is basically dither and create a negative image of this picture. Uh, Photograve is pretty easy to work, for, work with, and we basically just walk right across this top bar here. So I'm going to go ahead and open up my image. I'm going to find my BMP file, which is right here. I'm going to go ahead and select my material. Now, if you don't find the actual material that you're working with, um, you can find something very similar. Um, for this, because we're putting it on slate, I'm just going to go ahead and select my black granite setting. And if we come here to resize image, this is just showing us our image size and the DPI that we had sent it out as. Go ahead and hit OK. And so once I'm in my interactive mode, which if you open up for the first time, if you don't see the interactive mode, just click on this button here. And you can see this little icon go from red to green. Uh, the first thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to come down here and I'm going to click on Show Progress. That way when I make an adjustment, it automatically updates for me. Then I'm going to come over here, and I want to adjust my machine DPI to match my image DPI. So I'm going to change this 200, which is our default, to a 150. So over on the right is a simulation of my image. And if I look on the top here, I see this S, E, G, and O on both sides. Um, our S is for our simulate, as we can see on this right-hand side. Our E is for our original, or our engraved file. G is for our grayscale. And then O is our original. So I kind of look back and forth between my, my original here and my simulate. Um, with a lot of photos, I don't make a lot of adjustments inside of Photograve here. Um, if I do, I may adjust perhaps my extent or my strength of my extent. And what that does is kind of highlights a little bit more of my edges. So if I wanted to bring a little bit more detail out in the beard here, I can adjust this extent from maybe a 7 to, let's say, a 10. And so you can kind of see a little bit more of that detail being brought out. Uh, another adjustment I may make is down here under my grayscale with my gamma. Uh, what the gamma will do is kind of lighten or darken the photo up. You see how that lightens up, and if we decrease, we can darken them up a little bit. So I'm going to take this back up to around our 411 mark. Uh, let's say 394. And then once I'm happy with this, what I can do is click on my final process. This is just going to stamp all of these settings into place for me. 
And then I can go ahead and save my image. I want it to be an engraved image. And I'm going to hit OK. And we can see now, uh, next to our file name, we have ENGR, letting us know that that is our engravable file. And I'm going to go ahead and hit Save. Go ahead and minimize this. And what I'm going to do now is show you how many photos we should have here all together. So we basically should have four photos. We should have our original one here. We should have our CPT file, our original bitmap, and then our engravable file here. Our engravable file here is the one that we're actually going to bring into our RDWorks program. I'm going to go ahead and get that opened up. All right. So I'm going to go ahead and import our image in here. And we're going to find our AP Workshop 1 engrave. And here we go. Um, next, I'm going to go ahead and come up to config and system setting. And this allows me to change where my origin point is going to be. Um, I'm going to go ahead and keep it on the bottom center location and just go ahead and hit X here. I'm then going to come over here to the right hand side under mode and double click to bring up my layer parameters. Uh, this is where it allows me to adjust my speed, my power, and my interval. Now, when, when you're dealing with speed and power settings, um, there really is a, a small variance, um, even between the same machine size. Um, and part of that is due to that all of our laser tubes are unique in the fact that they all have their own peak power. Um, so what we have is we have an agreed upon power. So if you have one of our larger machines, we say that we agree that the, the wattage of the tube is at 100 watts. Um, but each tube may vary as far as where it's peaking out as power. Um, so while uh, one person may have a peak power of 104, 105, someone else may have a peak power of, say, 107, 108. That means that um, you can see small variances in, in the power that, that you're going to be setting your specific machine to. Uh, the machine that I'm working with currently um, is a little bit newer machine and it burns a little bit hotter. Um, I've done some tests already and I found that 28 speed and 21 power is a great setting for my size machine. So once you've done some testing, um, and you found these settings here, what you can do is actually save them for future reference. If we look at the top here, we have this parameter library. And I'm going to go ahead and click on this. And you can see I don't have anything saved. So I'm going to go ahead and click on my Save As button. And so here I can actually name this. So we'll say Photo on Slate. And I can leave myself notes as well. So what this allows me to do, I'm going to go ahead and exit out of here, is to quickly bring up these settings um, for future use, like I said. So I'm going to go ahead and make a change here. And say we're working with our rotary tool, and I'm just going to put some different numbers in here. Uh, so we'll say 15 speed, 75 power, and we'll switch our DPI to say 300, and hit OK. So when I come in here and I'm working with Slate again, all I have to do is come up here to this parameter library, select my photo on Slate, and hit load, and all of my settings are here, um, including my DPI. I'm going to go ahead and hit OK. And then I'm going to go ahead and download this to my machine. All right, so we're going to go ahead and move over to the, our, our actual machine now. OK, so as I had stated before, I went ahead and got a piece kind of preset here. 
So it's already been coded, and what I've done is actually measured out, and I took a little piece of masking tape and I marked on the bottom here. And I measured out and put a small little mark. Uh, this is telling me this is that bottom center part that I was looking for. So I'm going to go ahead and put this back inside. And we're going to switch our view over into our inside of our machine. I get a little bit closer here. So the first thing I want to do is I want to check my focus. So I'm going to bring my laser head kind of to the center of my material and take my focus stick and slide right up to my laser head. Uh, making sure that I'm nice and flush, I'm not catching on anything. And then I'm going to go ahead and proceed to my four corners of my machine. Or my material, I'm sorry. And I'm going to check the focus there as well. Now if I'm off on this focus here, that's when I would use my side leveling legs to adjust on each one of these corners. Get there. There. And we're good there. So now that I've ensured that I'm in focus, I'm going to go ahead and bring my laser head down. And what I want to do is I want to use my red dot here, and it's kind of hard to see, um, but I'm actually going to run it down the edge of the material. Now, with slate, it's got a, a chipped edge uh, for style and look, um, so this can be a little tricky at times. Um, but there is a flat edge on the back end of it. So as long as we kind of can find that and pick that up, we can move our, head la our laser head left and right, and then adjust our material slightly to make sure that we're nice and square. Once I've done that, I can kind of bring it back to my little witness mark here. And I'm gonna bring that down to the edge here. And I'm gonna go ahead and hit origin on my machine to lock that into place. What I can do now is very carefully remove my tape. And what we're going to do is go ahead and frame this out. Now this piece here is just a little bit smaller than what our actual working area is. So I can quickly come back over to my computer screen here. And on the top left hand corner here, um, I can see my ratios. And so if I lock my ratio here, I'm just going to minimize this a little bit on my width and change it from a 7.9 down to a 7.8 and hit enter just to adjust that down a little bit. So we can see we can, took off almost a quarter inch from our height. And I'm going to go ahead and re-download. Okay, and then we're going to come back to our machine here. And we're going to frame out again. And now we can see that we're hitting exactly along all of our edges. So from here what we're going to go ahead and do is we're going to close our lid. And hit start. Now a size, or a photo this size uh, should roughly take you an etching time around uh, anywhere from five to eight minutes.
so while that's going, um, and we're waiting for it to finish, if you guys have some questions you'd like to uh, send me, I'll be more than happy to answer any questions. So uh, the question I just got in um, was what settings um, am I using? Um, on this machine here, I'm using a 28 speed, 21 power with a 150 DPI or an interval of a 0 .006. Um, I've got a question here for, um, can I show you how to invert the picture in Photograve again? Uh, yes, I can definitely do that. And um, Sherry had asked a question, will I be showing how to add background and text? Uh, yes, I will be doing that in a separate session. But as far as Photograve goes, um, let me jump back to my computer here. So inverting the image is actually done with Photograve. Uh, Photograve is going to do all of that work for me. Um, so this way, you don't have to really think too much about it. Um, Photograve is a very intuitive program, and I've actually got a uh, video or a session we're going to do later on where we're going to be working strictly with Photograve. No photo editing or anything like that. Um, with Photograve, it kind of finds your, your baseline settings, um, based off of your material and our machine. So when you first get Photograve and you install it, um, you typically will select AP Laser and the size machine that you have. Um, Charles is asking, um, what are the preferred softwares for image work on slate, granite, tile, and acrylic? Um, so uh, Corel Photo Paint and Photograve are what I recommend for, for both those. Um, again, we do. I am going to be doing more videos over various products. So one of the things that we are going to be doing is doing a photograph on acrylic. Uh, we're also going to be doing a photograph on wood and an and a mirror. Um, so those those sessions are coming on on their way. I think uh, towards the end of the month and uh, beginning of next month, uh, we'll when we'll be doing those videos. So just stay tuned. Um, we are also going to be looking into trying to increase this a little bit more and not limit it just to 10 people per session. Um, this is our first go around, so there's always uh, work to be done and improvements we can make. Um, so we are hoping to actually be starting to stream this live on YouTube um, and it will be open up to everybody. Um, and so you don't have to try to rush to register or anything like that. Um, yes, Photograve did invert the photo by itself um, as soon as I hit save. Uh, Michelle has asked uh, which lens are we using in this and we are actually using the two inch lens. Um, I also prefer to or like to use occasionally uh, the inch and a half lens for photo engraving just because the dot size is a lot finer. All right, and it looks like we're just about finished up here. So let's go look and see what we have. Open this up. Now, one thing that, that Slate is known for is being kind of dusty. So I've got some paper towel here. I'm gonna get my image out. I dust it off a little bit. And I'll show you guys a couple views here. So this here is our final product. And so we can kind of kind of see we've got some great detail here, um, especially in the beard and the glasses. Um, we can see our little drop shadow halo down here at the bottom. And 
And I've got a couple other questions here. Let's see if I can get to you. Um, Charles is asking, he's got a 2616 and a 60 watt using light burn. Um, well, I need, to, need the RD works as well. Um, Charles, you should already have RD works with your computer. Um, it should have come uh, with some standard equipment, but no, no, it is not necessary. Um, we will be doing some videos over photo editing with Lightburn. Um, I can tell you this much though, uh, Lightburn is not as intuitive as Photograve. And mainly just because Lightburn does so much already, um, it's hard to cram that much information into one program. Um, where Photograve, you can see, is very easy, very simple to use. It does a lot of the work for us already. Um, another question I have here is, um, the 1.5 lens combo is still out of stock. Can I get a 1.5 nozzle and use that with the, the other parts? So no, the, the cones are not, the nozzles are not interchangeable between the different types of lenses. Um, those are pretty specific to it. Um, I do believe we do have the one and a half inch lenses in stock. And if you have, if you don't see something on our store, please uh, give our tech support line a call at 844-364-8211. And any one of our service technicians will be more than happy to double check that stock and fill an order for you if you need it. Um, I had someone else ask, um, they were asking what I had sprayed on the slate prior to engraving. Um, and it's actually this uh, acrylic lacquer. Um, like I said, I picked this up at, at Walmart for around four or five dollars. You don't need a lot of this. Like I said, it just kind of coats it and adds in a little bit of a shine to it and just makes that engraving pop out a little bit more, but isn't absolutely necessary. Um, so, oh, we do have another question here. Um, recommended, deaded, uh, recommended settings for an 1812. Um, that comes from uh, Calvin. Uh, Calvin, I would just recommend sampling and testing out. Um, we do have available a, a speed and power grid on our AP Laser University site that you can download um, that will actually allow you to run a quick test on things. Um, I know with the 1812, you do typically need to burn it a little bit or run it a little bit hotter than the larger machines just because it is a lower wattage of a machine. Okay, and I think we've got all these questions. Um, again, feel free to shoot me an email if you have any more. Um, and I look forward to you guys attending uh, more of our classes and hopefully you've enjoyed this one. You guys have a great weekend. Bye.